First you will hear is none other than Pastor Che Cohen. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Put your hands together. Bless the Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. Before you sit down, let's just pray together. Amen. Man, I'm excited about what God is about to do in our church, what God is doing in your lives. Uh, man, what He's already begun and started in this series and just the things that He's working out. And um, I pray that if this area, this area of anxiety and depression is something that you've had to deal with, whether in your life or in a loved one's life, that you've received some hope and direction and some help already. And uh, we're going further. Someone say we're going further. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we bless you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that you care for us. Spirit, soul, and body. And the Father, entire person, the entire or entire beings, Lord God, that you'd want to sanctify us, spirit, soul, and body, Lord God, that every part of us matters to you. And so, Father, even as we talk about our minds, we talk about this area of anxiety and depression, Lord, I thank you that you care. You care for us when we struggle in the areas of our emotions and our feelings and our relationships and our, our past and the things that are in the dark you care for us and so today lord god we submit ourselves to you we say god we're open to hearing you speak to us we're open to obeying your voice we're open to doing what you've called us to do and we say lord speak for your servant hears Father, we love you. We thank you. Use me today, Lord God. Wear me like a glove. Be the substance of all that's said and done. God, I promise to give you the glory and to give you the honor and to give you the praise. And Lord God, we, we, we come here to be changed that we would leave different than we came in. We give you thanks in Jesus' name and everyone say, Amen, Amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together if you believe God this morning. I'm excited. You gave me be seated. You may be seated. I'm excited. Um, we've been we've been doing some some handouts and stuff. Uh, we've been providing some resources over this these past few weeks, and this week is no different. Um, I got a, a a great handout for you right here. You should have gotten it when you came in, and uh, it's the mentally strong resource list. And we have a, a list of books. We have a list of online services and phone services. We have a list of um, counselors that are in the area, in the local area. Listen, if you're online, all of our resources are online. You can get all the resources on our website. If you've come in late and you, you weren't a part of our first two messages, we have some resources on the guest central table on your way out or on our website. But um, I want to let you know about, about these right here. Uh, here are a list of books that I just want to really quickly just highlight to you these most of these are books i've read a couple of them are books that some counselor friends of mine gave me and said hey these would be would be good so um there you go man some really really good stuff in here listen this is one of the ways can i tell you something you gotta read i'm, I'm gonna encourage you to read if you don't like to read listen listen to a book let me tell you why People have taken 20, 30, 40 years of their experience and boiled it down into five hours of a book. You can learn an entire lifetime of somebody else's experience in one book. Amen. Amen. That's very good, Pastor Jay. Thank you so much. Amen. You know the difference between the person who can't read and the person who don't read? Nothing. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's move on. How to, find a, so, how to find a therapist for you. There's a, a link there on the top that just gives you guidance on how to find a therapist that you can use that would be helpful for you or your family member. Um, these counseling services that we have here are not recommendations. This is just a directory. And what we're saying is go on the link and uh, follow the steps about how to find somebody that fits you. Because guess what? You have to find somebody that fits you. 
Like, everybody don't fit everybody. So just try and find somebody who fits you. you. You try somebody, you don't like them, hey, find somebody else, right? And then uh, phone and online services, these are things you can just, from your phone, you can text a number, you can call somebody or whatever, anonymous counselors, people, suicide hotline, all these things are right here. Here's the thing, you want this, I'll tell you why, because you never know when you're in a situation where you need to help somebody else out or you need to help yourself out. And this thing, just being at your fingertips, you have an answer right away, all right? We can't keep all these things in our head, and so this is what this is for. Amen. Amen. Are we good? Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. You're in a church that's helping you. Amen. Man, we're not just saying, hey, you know what, uh, 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 I'll pray a little prayer for you, and that's it. No, I'm, I'm actually giving you some stuff. That's going to help you to make this thing work. Amen. All right. So we are in the middle of a series called Mentally Strong. Someone say Mentally Strong. And I love the fact that this morning we spoke. There were so many songs about battle. I love it. Battle. Why? Because mental health is a battle. Right? Um, dealing with chronic uh, anxiety is a battle. Dealing with depression is a battle. This is a fight, guys. And the thing about um, anxiety and depression is that they can cripple you and make you just feel like you have no hope. And if you approach it that way, then you're always walking as a victim. What we want to do in this series is help you know that you have something to fight with. There is a battle going on, and you're not the loser. Amen. We win. Somebody shout, we win. we win. Amen. So I want to tell you um, what happened. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I spoke to you about my, I told you a story about my son, Joshua, who pulled over to the side of the road and he was having a panic attack. He thought he was going to die. And so he called 911 and they came out there. And, and um, so uh, several, maybe a couple of months after that, I, I can't remember exactly the timeline, but um, Josh had gone through some, some, uh, Therapy in terms of in in uh, what do you call it uh, when you're not not outpatient but inpatient yes I guess that's the opposite of outpatient so uh, inpatient therapy then some outpatient therapy and then he was doing some counseling and and you know there was this one day in particular I was driving home from work and it was just really on my mind you know when it was just I was just going through a lot um, just thinking about him praying about him and um, a friend of mine came to to mind this this guy named Sly. And so Sly is a, a guy in our church that's a, like one and big buff kind of rah, you know, kind of, but he's a fitness trainer. And so he trained at this, this major gym in our area and, and all this kind of stuff. And so I, I called Sly because Josh had wanted to start working out. And so I called Sly. I said, hey, Sly, here's the situation. Josh wants to start working out. I, I need your help because here's what's going on with him mentally. So I just start telling him all this stuff. Well, what I didn't know was that Sly had dealt with all of that when he was younger. And he was, he was a guy that just dealt with a lot of depression. He dealt with a lot of anxiety. He went through a lot of this stuff in his own life. And so he felt like, hey, you know what? I, this is perfect. Like, I've been praying for you guys. Like, Joshua was on my heart. I didn't know what was going on. But now I know what it is. Like, God has really has been speaking to me about him, not knowing that he's going through what I went through when I was younger. So that was wild. So I connected them and I got them in. And so he started talking to him about it. And, and it's funny because what started happening is that as Joshua was starting to work out, it, I, I saw a certain amount of stability come into his life. How many of you know that we're, we're spirit, soul, and body? Yes. 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 The Bible says this, which is interesting. The Bible says that uh, only the word of God can separate your spirit from your soul. That means your spirit, soul, and body are so interconnected and so tight that you can't separate between the three of them. In fact, your body and your soul are like, they're like married. Till death do they part. All right? They are just, they're just together forever. That's how it is. And so what you do in your spirit affects your soul and your body. What you do in your body affects your soul. How many of you know, whatever you do in your body affects your soul. Whatever happens in your soul affects your body. That's why when you go to the doctor and you're going through some kind of problem, that one of the first questions they ask you is, how much stress have you been under lately? Anybody ever hear that? And you go, I have a pain in my shoulder. What are you talking about? Well, we just want to know what your emotional state is because what's you going on in your emotions impact your body so as josh was working out his emotions start to stabilize you watch me 
And so here it is. What happened with, with this relationship was that uh, Sly started off as his workout guy. And then, then his relationship with Sly got deeper and strong until Josh started to open up a lot with Sly. And so what happened over time is that Sly ended up becoming his mentor. And so Sly helped him get a job, write his resume, do interviews, helped him to do like all kinds of, uh, helped him with his apartment, helped him to do all these things. All the things that he wouldn't allow me to do, Sly did for him. <laughs> but what might I tell you the story? Because when it comes to this battle of anxiety and depression, this is not a battle you fight on your own. You have to, and today's message is called, assemble an army to help you fight the battle that you're in. Right? We don't go into this war by ourselves and our little gun and we're like, okay, army, we're coming out. No, we need an entire battalion to work with us in order to fight this thing that we're dealing with personally and internally. And in order to build this army, there are three things uh, we've got, we're talking about today. Two of them you have to stop, and one of them you have to start. So two things you have to stop doing, one thing you have to start doing. So number one, let's start with this. Number one, stop in your notes isolating yourself. Stop isolating yourself. God didn't design you to do life on your own. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says that when God created the heaven and the earth, like everything was void and it was all messed up, like nothing was in order. And God said, let there be light and there was light. And then God said, that, that's good. And then he, he, uh, and then he gathered the waters together and he separated from that. He said, that's good. He made the sun and the moon and the stars. And he said, that's good. And then he, he put plants and animals and birds and fish. And he said, that's good. Then he made man. And he said, huh. Something's not good. <laughs> he said, it is not good that man be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. The only time God said that something in his creation was not good was man's solitary confinement. And that's what prisoners understand. That the greatest part punishment they can do. Can you imagine? You commit a crime and they put you in prison so they can separate you from society, from your loved ones, from your family, from all of that. And you get, you get put in, incarcerated in prison. And that's not the worst punishment. Because in prison, there is worse punishment in prison. And it's not the guards beating you. And it's not them keeping food from you. It's not that. The worst punishment in prison is solitary confinement you know what's worse than any other punishment you can imagine is being alone are you following me? what happens to many of us is that we are going through the stuff we're going through in terms of anxiety and depression and we have chosen solitary confinement as our answer to the problem the one thing that God said is not good is the one thing we're doing to ourselves. Are you hearing me live, church? You see, here's what happens to all of us. All of us have a desire to be intimate. And what I mean by that is to be fully known, fully accepted, and fully loved. Every single one of us. When we get married, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to get to a place with this other person where I'm fully known, fully accepted, and fully loved. People say, I just want to be loved for who I am. That's what that means. Right? When you're chasing, when people are chasing, um, chasing sex before marriage and they're chasing relationship after relationship, here's the desire. The desire is not the sex. The desire is fully known, fully accepted, Fully loved. I want you to hear me. Everybody wants to be fully known, fully accepted, fully loved. Here's the problem. When we're going through something like anxiety and something like depression, what we are hoping is that we will be fully loved and fully accepted, but we don't, we are afraid of being fully known. Because in our heart, in our mind, what we think is this. If you really knew me, Come on now, you can finish this sentence. You wouldn't really love me. 
That's the, tra- the challenge is, can you fully love me without fully knowing me? And it can't work. And so there's always this struggle where I'm trying to hold back a part of myself, but hoping I can still feel the full acceptance and the full love, but I can't fully love you if I don't fully know you. Are you following me? And what happens is the fear of letting people know what's really going on in my heart stops us from experiencing the full acceptance and full love because we feel that those people will be turned off. And so we go into solitary confinement and we only come out for the parts of us that we think people accept and love. And then the parts that we don't think they accept and love, we run back in the prison. So what's the first thing you got to do? You got to stop isolating yourself. Here's what uh, Genesis 2.25. This is God. God speaking. God just explaining what was going on in creation. Genesis 2.25 says, And they were both naked. Or if you were from the south, you said naked. <laughs> They're both naked. All right. Both naked. And the man and his wife and were not ashamed. Someone said not ashamed. You know, this is not just talking about your physical bodies. This is talking about the fact that they were open, vulnerable, totally transparent, and they weren't ashamed of anything. And you can know. Listen, Adam and Eve didn't even have time to sin before this happened, so we understand. There was no shame. But as soon as they sinned, what happened? They started to cover up. They put on all kinds of leaves and all kinds of things and cover themselves up. And God said, hey, what's going on? Why are you hiding? He said, well, because we're naked. What? You were fully, I was fully open. And now I realize, oh no, I don't want people to see parts of me. And so we cover up. And God says, you know what? In order to battle this thing of, 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 um, of anxiety and depression, you need an army and you need people who know, who can see behind the leaves. Amen. 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 We want to be fully loved (laughs) and fully accepted, but we have to be fully known. We don't let people in, and this is the challenge I want to um, kind of work with you, is that when you don't let people in, you end up suffering in silence. Thank you for that one hand clap over there. Let me see. So, <laughs> you suffer in silence. And, and look, look, we have some good reasons, right? We do it because um, we may be hurt in the past. And so we remember the last time that somebody got very close, we got hurt. Or sometimes it's because we're protecting others and we don't want to burden them with our burden, right? And so out of our, our own uh, care for them, we say, hey, I don't want to do that. Or we grew up bearing burdens. Maybe we grew up in a home or our family of origin never spoke about deep, hard things. Never spoke about conflict things, never spoke about, never even, so we sweep stuff under the rug and that's how we grew up and just, that's how we dealt with problems. And in fact, we were always told to, hey, grow up, deal with your own thing, you know, man, take care of your own business, pull up your own socks. And so we, we get that kind of thing, right? And we grew up in that kind of house and so therefore we don't, we don't talk about stuff. We don't become vulnerable. We don't let people or we don't want people to think differently about us. Like if they ever knew this then what would they think about me? And we, or we don't want to face reality. Sometimes we're going through it. But because we get over it from time to time, we just go, well, that was just temporary. That was just a thing. And when we decide to keep parts of ourselves back from those we love, we end up isolating from the intimacy we so desire. So instead of giving our loved ones a chance to help, we willingly... Enter solitary confinement, trying to fight by ourselves. Ecclesiastes 4. Here's what it says. Ecclesiastes 4, verse uh, 9. It says, two people are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out to help. But if someone, someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Someone who falls alone... They're in trouble. The Bible says if two of you are together, you can fight with each other. You can protect each other. You can defend each other. But if you're alone and you fall, who's there to help you? You've got to let somebody in in order for them to be able to help you. And here's the thing, you know, people who love you want to fight by your side. That's the thing that a lot of times people who struggle with anxiety and depression don't realize. That we want to help. But you won't give us an opportunity. You got to stop isolating yourself. Boy, this is hard. 
It's hard. But it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Uh, um, if you want to win the war, partner with people who can help you. Partner with people who can help you when you fall. James uh, 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That you may be healed. And oftentimes, what happens to us is that we're walking through injuries that we don't have healing for because we won't confess the injury to anybody else. And we, we, we walk in this position. Well, I talked to God about it. Why doesn't God heal me? I've confessed it to God. God, you know this is my problem. You know I struggle with this. You know this has been problem. This has been going over and over again. God, help me, heal me, heal me, heal me. And God says, "Hey, guess what? Uh, confess your sins to me." The Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And God says, "I forgive you." He said, "Yeah, but heal me. Go talk to somebody else. I want to talk to you." <laughs> The thing is that when we confess our sins to God, God says, I'll heal you. But he says, there are some things I have reserved for you to get healing from through confessing to another person. So we want God to heal us of all of these things. And he says, talk to somebody. So, but God, it's me and you, Jesus, me and you. And he says... It's not, it's, not just, it's not just me and you. It's me, you, but it's you and them as well. Amen. You got to get an army around you. You got to get people around you who are going to help you through this pro- problem. So some things won't heal unless you confess it to someone else. So the first thing you got to stop is stop isolating yourself. Tell the person beside you, stop isolating yourself. <laughs> stop isolating yourself. Here's the second thing you got to do. Second thing you got to do is start recruiting the right people. Come on now. Start recruiting the right people. You got to start recruiting the right people. Uh, When you don't know what to do, do you know where to go? That's a question. When you don't know what to do, do you have somewhere to go? Do you have somebody to call? You got to surround yourself with people who love you enough to fight with you and fight to the end. This is not a one-day thing. This is a let us fight to the end. So the first person you need to have uh, is family. So family. F for family. First family, family, family. If you are married, in the name of Jesus, your spouse needs to be the first person on your list. Can someone say amen? amen? Listen, man. Let your spouse in. And some, here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes we let our spouse in 90% of the way, but there is 10% that we hold back. You got to let them in all the way. You got to let them know how bad it gets. You got to let them know how serious this is in your mind. The thoughts that you're going through, the things you're struggling with. You got to talk to your spouse, man. You got to get them in. You've got to let them know. If you're a kid, if you're under somebody else's care, talk to your parents. Let them know. You know what my son said to me? My son said, listen, you are my first counselors. I don't care what anybody else says. You're the first people I call when I'm in trouble. You say, well, I don't have that kind of relationship. But work on it. Work on it. Get to it. Because here's what happens with our spouse and with our, our parents. And, and sometimes you're a parent and you need to tell your children, hey, this is what mommy's going through. This is what I'm battling with. This is what's going on. You, sometimes, let me tell you something. There is more compassion than there is judgment. And you have to know this. That your family members want to help. And here's the thing. They see that something is wrong already. They just don't know what it is. But they see. When you talk to them, it's not like they're going to go, really? They're going to go, oh, that makes sense. That's what they're going to respond. Family. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. It doesn't mean that a brother is born to give you adversity. That's not what that means. What it means in times of adversity, 
the person you can depend on and rely on the most is your family. You say, you don't know my family. I hear you. I got you. <laughs> but somebody in your family, I mean, come on. Let, uh, let me read it in the Good News translation. It says, a friend, friends always show their love. What are relatives for if not to share trouble? What are relatives for if not to share trouble? There's some people in my family that I haven't spoken to in years. But just because they are family, if I call them, they're going to open their door to me. Just because of my last name. You know what I'm saying? Just because my mother and their mother are sisters. Just because it's just some kind of family thing. It's just like, oh, well, it's family. What else are you going to do? you going to help. That is how family works. So Josh, like when Josh was going through this stuff, I didn't know how many people in my family was struggling with stuff to do with mental health till I had a son who was struggling with mental health. All of a sudden, once I started cheering with family, it's like, oh, well, I've dealt with that. What? You didn't tell me. Well, and I've dealt with that. And, I've dealt with and the amount of family that came in, called him, hey, Josh, talk to me. Let's talk. And we just talk. And he would just talk to my sister and my, well, mostly sister. I have a lot of sisters. So uh, sister one, sister two, sister three, like, like, <laughs> like all my sisters now have a different relationship with him because of what he struggled with because they also had to deal with some of those things. Does that make sense? Family. Number two, friends. Friends, friends, friends. Uh, Proverbs 27, 9. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. I love that. Message Bible says, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul. Mm. Proverbs 12, 26. Uh, this was a good one for you. The righteous choose their friends carefully. But the way, way of the wicked leads them astray. Hey, this is a good scripture for, if you're a parent, this is a great scripture right here. The righteous chooses their friends carefully. Just put this up somewhere in your child's room. The righteous. Here's the thing. You, look, you, you can't tell every friend. But you need to tell some friend. Somebody needs to walk through it with you. And here's the thing. Not only did, did Josh need friends, I needed friends. Because we had never come this way before. So I had to have friends who could identify with me. Friends who wouldn't think, oh, you're a pastor and your child go through that? <laughs> friends who could say, hey, look, it's okay. We get it. We understand. Let me help. Right? I remember the other day. This is since I've been here. Right? Um, I had a situation with Josh and, and he had come off his medication and he was feeling like he was spiraling. He was spiraling. He was spiraling. And, and so I, I was here and I'm calling and he's in Texas. I'm in California. And so I'm call, and we're talking on the phone and he says, man, I'm doing bad. I'm doing really bad. I said, all right, let's talk. And he was just in a place of despair. And man, I, I picked up my phone. After I said, all right, Josh, I'll call you back in a sec. I call Pastor Paul. I said, hey, I need help. Why? Because he's my friend. And I'm not fighting this battle by myself. I said, Pastor Paul, man, I need help. Help me. What do I do? He said, hey, you know what? Here's the thing. Maybe they just need to change his meds. Just talk to him and tell him, hey, there's other meds out there. This is not the only one. And maybe something else could work. So just be patient. Let's try something else. Da, da, da. Listen, we got him connected to a different doctor. Got a different kind of thing. Boom. Night and day. Amen. 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 But here's the thing. If I was suffering alone, I would have never known. If I didn't have an army around me, I would have never known to go in that direction. Friends. Number three. Faith community. Faith community. Um, the Bible says if you walk with the wise... You become wise, but a companion of fools suffer harm. Sometimes we just around some fools in our lives. You get what I'm saying? People who don't have any answer, any hope, any direction. Not, not, all they can do is, but you feel less judged by them because they're just as messed up. You see what I'm saying? And so because they're messed up, you feel like, hey, I want to be around them because then they don't judge me. I don't judge them. And then yet, ta-da, we're like judgment-free Come on, it's so true. Am I right? 
Thank you very much. It's so true. We know it. We know it. We know it. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. You can't become wise around them. You got to walk with the wise to become wise. So he said, well, so what's the what's solution to that? That's why we have this thing called life groups. Amen? Life groups. What's life groups? Life groups is a small bunch of wise people <laughs> who get together and can help each other to grow. He said, why, why do you call them wise? Because the Bible says, watch this, the Bible says that a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So when you're in, when you're in a, a, small, a small group, life group, what happens is that you have a bunch of people who believe, who know that God is their source, their strength, their hope, and they're all trying to grow with Him, and they'll bring you along. And so if you're not in a life group, you need to get in a life group. Get in a life group. The amount of friendships, the amount of relationships, healthy relationships that you can develop in a life group is in, incredible. And just that environment, just people talking about, hey, I was hurt, but now I'm healed. I was broken, but now I'm bound together. I was in prison, but now I'm free. Just people that you go, go, you, you, oh my gosh, that's where I'm at. If he can do it for you, he can do it for... Oh. Instead, we're around people who say, yeah, I'm still struggling, man. Yeah, me, me too, I'm still struggling, man. And nobody have any hope. Amen. Hey, number four, four. Fourth person you need in your army. Doctors. Someone say doctors. Amen. Doctors. amen, amen, amen. You know what? Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, the healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. Jesus didn't condemn doctors. Jesus said, if you're not well, go to a doctor. <laughs> go to a doctor. And here's the thing. Just start with your primary care physician. Why? Because you know what? There's some things, some of the stuff that you're going through, sometimes it just has to do with nutrition. Sometimes it has to do with exercise. Sometimes it has to do with, man, I remember one time, well, uh, once again, Josh is, is, is the person who I have to talk about. But one time he was going through some stuff and just some allergy medicine helped to just reduce some stuff. I was like, allergy medicine, look at that. Would have never even guessed it. You see what I'm saying? All I'm saying is there are things that you need to know about yourself that you don't know about yourself, that sometimes just being with a physician can help you sort out. Don't be afraid of the doctor and don't be afraid to tell them that this is, not, this is more than physical. This is also my emotional state. Like something is happening inside my soul. Talk to them. And if you have to get something for, for hormones, if you have to get something for a chemical balance, then that's fine. Guess what? Let me tell you something. That's it. Spirit, soul, body, right? Look, look. I, I have, I struggle with high blood pressure. That's what I deal with. So guess what I do? I eat right. I exercise. And I take medication. And guess what? I do all of them. All of the above, not one or the other. Guess why? Because I know that I need to stay uh, uh, alive long enough to enjoy some of the things I want to enjoy. Amen? I want to see my daughters married. Somebody, my son, fine. I don't care about you, but. <laughs> I want to see my daughters married. So, guess what? I'm going to try, I'm going to do what I can. Sometimes people go like, oh, but if I take medication for my mind, somehow that is worse than taking medication for you. It's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Somebody say, well, I don't want to take it for the rest of my life. You know what? At this point, that's how I felt too when I first started on like, you know, high blood pressure medication. Well, I don't want to take this for the rest of my life. I don't want da 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 da. You know, after a while, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to take it as long as I need to. And for, if it's forever, then it's forever. I don't care as long as I stay alive so I can see my children get married. Does that make sense? We'll be like, oh, well, you shouldn't have that. God, Lord, is your healer. Well, guess what? If he chooses to heal me through medicine, he chooses to heal me through medicine. I'm fine with that. 
All right, two more, two more, two more. <laughs> oh, gosh. Here we go. All right, all right. Counselors. The next one, counselors. Hey, doctors don't replace counselors. What's a counselor? Hey, the doctor's going to take care of medical, medically, da, da, da. But counselor's going to try and figure out what is the root cause of this anxiety? Right. What's the root cause of this depression? What is going on? Proverbs 24, 6 says, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. Wise counsel. You will wage your... In other words, don't go into war without a counselor. We're fighting a war here. Don't do it without a counselor. Then look what he says there. In a multitude of counselors, there is what? There's safety. Do you know who wrote this proverb? The wisest man in the world, Solomon, who didn't need anybody's counsel, says to everybody, I need counsel. So if you think you're wiser than Solomon, don't get a counselor. Listen to me. Getting help isn't a sign of weakness. Getting help is a sign of wisdom. I'm going to say it again. It's in your notes. Getting help isn't a sign of weakness. Getting help is a sign of wisdom. Wise people get help. Wise people get counsel. Wise people. I remember I was, when I was coming up here to the high desert. Man, I had, like I, I told you guys, there's some, a whole lot of anxiety to deal with moving and moving the family and, and everybody. Did it. And I remember sitting down with a counselor because I said, hey, I, I'm getting a counselor. I said, babe, I'm getting a counselor. Man, I've been, I've been dealing with this anxiety thing now for a couple of weeks. I don't want to keep doing it. So I'm, I'm going to get a counselor. So I, I looked up, found a counselor, sat down with her, we went through a couple of sessions. And in one session, we were talking, and, I, and she said, so tell me some of the burdens you carry. So I said, part of the problem I have is that here it is. The Lord is calling me to this thing, but I am now bringing everybody. Like, you know, I mean, my... my I have a 12-year-old daughter who, I mean, the school, I have to move her from school. The dad, the son, you know, he didn't know what he was doing yet. So, so I'm going through all of these things. And she said, oh, she said, I get it. You think that this call is all about you. I said, yes. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Who is getting the job? Who is getting the position? Who has the call of God on their lives? Oh, 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 it's me. I am the main focal point of this whole thing. Everybody's doing it because of me. <laughs> and she said to me, Do you think that God is wise enough <laughs> that his call on your daughter's life is what he's actually looking out for. And he needs you to move so that she can fulfill her call in Jesus. Hey! Do you think that there are other people in your family whose call is dependent on you moving? Like if you don't move, they won't fulfill what God has for them? You're making it about you when God has all of you in mind. Somehow that shifted my entire thinking. I was like, ah. so I was just, I was just full of pride. Yep. I didn't see that before. <laughs> I got it now. It's not about me. It's about him and his purpose for every person that he is taking care of in my family. And that thing set me free. Here's what. A counselor is what I needed. Counselor. Get some counseling. You get pastoral counseling or you get professional counseling, but get some counseling. And if we can't help you, listen, if you come to us as pastors and we realize, hey, this is beyond us, we're going to tell you, look, there's a list that Pastor Che gave out. <laughs> Please refer. <laughs> All right? So that's what we're going to do. All right. So counselors, and, and here's the last one, mentors, mentors. Put in mentors, right? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Mentors. What, what do mentors do? What's the difference between counselor and mentor? Counselor is going to help you look at your past and help you figure out why you got where you are. A mentor is going to be pushing you forward. Yes. A mentor is always going to challenge you to do more than you think you can do. Yes. They're always going to be telling you, hey man, that's not an excuse. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Last thing. So you got to stop isolating. Number two, start building that recruiting that team and number three stop pretending you're okay 
stop pretending you're okay. I got to go through this fast. Your army can't go to battle with you unless they know how bad it is. But we're good at masking what's going on on the inside. <laughs> and the thing about anxiety and depression is that it can trickle. It can trickle, right? It's, it, was, it was only two hours uh, a, a year ago, and, and now I'm dealing with it uh, five hours or five days or whatever, and it can trickle and just kind of increase over time. And what's happening is that your brain and body are warning you, but you keep sweeping it under the rug because like emotions, just like the weather, it passes. And because it passes, you just figure, hey, I'm okay now. I got through it. And so guess what? Nothing's wrong with me. Listen, I remember uh, one time I was in, in Texas, I'd gone back to Texas to visit, and um, I was driving the car and I saw the, the gas light come on, you know? And you know, you know how it is. I don't know if you know how it is. My wife always fills up at quarter tank, right? No matter what. Quarter tank, she's like, fill it up. Oh, there you go. There you go. All right, yeah, yeah. How many of you, the orange light has to almost turn red? There we go. That's it. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing. So I'm, I'm like, but here's, the, here's with me though. I couldn't get to the gas station, stuff like that. But I know my car. I know my car. Listen, I know my car has some more miles in it. That's all right. I'm supposed to meet this friend for coffee. That day. And so I drive Cyan to school, drop her off, and my car doesn't move out of the parking lot. Out of gas, dry. You know, the thing about it is, I knew there was something wrong, but everybody else who saw the car thought everything was fine. Because the car didn't drive any slower on the highway. The car didn't look any different. But I knew something was wrong. And I thought, I know my car. I can make it. I couldn't. <laughs> and if you're running out of gas, you need to admit that you're not okay. It's okay to admit you're not okay. But the reason we don't, so this is hard, but this is what my problem is going to be your problem. The reason you don't is pride. It's pride. I don't know, but I'm just trying to protect them. That's pride. Because you think you can protect them. You can't protect them. You think. You got it. Listen to what Obadiah 3, verse 3. Obadiah. <laughs> Dust off that book. All right. <laughs> Obadiah 3, verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart... Who will bring me down to the ground? See, the pride in our heart deceives us to let us think we're okay. We'll never fall. It doesn't happen that way. You can't wait until you reach, hit rock bottom to start addressing the issues in your life that are contributing to your anxiety or your depression. You can't wait till you reach rock bottom. You've got to be able to say, hey, listen, I'm not okay. I'm not going to pretend like I'm okay. I'm just going to come out and just tell you the truth. Here's where I'm at. Here's what the problem is. And allow God, trust God to keep those relationships. Trust God to keep those people to help you walk through this. So you're not doing it alone. The thing is this. Sometimes there are things in our lives that we need to let go of that are causing the anxiety that are causing the depression, there are unhealthy habits, there are things that we're entertaining in our lives, things that we're holding on to, in relationships or things that are going on that are contributing to it and we don't want to deal with it. And God is saying, you've got to deal with that. You've got to cut it off. And sometimes you need help in order to truly get there. Sometimes you need some accountability in order for you to let go of those things. And those things, those things that need to have a necessary ending for you to move on. Those things, those situations or people or issues or habits that need to be addressed. Sometimes something needs to die in your life in order for you to truly live. Jesus says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bring forth much fruit. But if it dies, it will bring forth a harvest. And so here's the thing. Sometimes some things in your life have to die in order for you to live. 
And that's what I really want to bring you to. I want you to understand that the things that cause your anxiety and depression need to die. There are some things. And here's the thing. Sometimes it's uh, some things you don't know. And, that, and hear me. If you don't know, that's why you get your army. Hey, man, is there a blind spot in my life? Is there something that I'm doing in my life that I don't see? Is there some destructive behavior that's going on in my life that I don't see that might be leading me to anxiety and depression? Sometimes it's stuff that you do know and you don't want to let go of. And God says, you need help. And that's why we need to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Because we, if we don't do that, we don't have no accountability. We have nobody to help us, to walk beside us, to say, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And so today, I don't know if you have thought of this, but what in your life do you need to let go of in order to become a victor over this thing called depression and anxiety. Bow your heads with me for a second. We're going to pray a little bit. I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? What are you saying to me today through this message? Are there things that I consistently do that cause my anxiety to go up? Are there things under my control that cause me to spiral into a state of depression? Are there people in my life that I'm keeping at arm's length, keeping out? Because I don't want them to know just how bad it's gotten. Am I trying to defend or protect a reputation? The car looks good on the outside, but I'm running out of gas. Lord, show me. As we get ready to pray, our prayer team is coming up right now. And I want you, as you're, as you're asking God, To just really take whatever that thing is that you need to let go of and give it to him. Whoever those people are that you need to let in to build your army around. That you start to pray God, give them grace to hear what I have to say. Well, we have our prayer team up here because... We want to pray you through this. Whether it's, it's to do with this message or it's to do with something that you're facing right now. Whatever you're going through. Whatever you're going through. And here's the thing. Because I'm opening, up to, opening it up to whatever you're going through. Nobody's watching you thinking, oh, you, you must struggle. with No, no, no. No. People don't know. And plus, it's none of their business anyway. Don't let your own pride, your own insecurity, your own whatever prevents you from getting prayer because God wants to touch you today. So if you're praying, if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, in a moment we're going to sing one more song to end and I'm going to ask everyone to stand up and when I do, I'm just going to ask you to slip out from where you're sit seated and then just come and pray. So let me pray and then we're going to sing, Father, thank you so much. I pray, Father, for every person here that they would have the boldness, the courage, the humility to come for prayer and that they would receive a touch from you deep in their souls. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet, everybody. You can come up for prayer at this time. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how. If you're online, there's a link that's right there for you. If you need prayer, just click on that link. Just let us know what your prayer request is and someone will be in touch with you.